Hello everybody, this is Dr. Jack Chuang. Thanks for coming back for another psychology lecture. I guess you're not tired of me yet. And uh, today we're going to focus on the chapter on motivation and emotion, but I'm covering just the motivation part of this chapter for my course. I'm basing my lecture off of the materials from Psychology 2nd Edition from openstacks.org, so feel free to check that out. It's a free uh, e-textbook if you want to look at it and read it online. You can also download it as a PDF, so it's fairly flexible, or buy a printed version if you want to from Amazon. It's fairly cheap, under $40. Okay, uh, you can find this channel, Psychology Concepts Explained, either through your podcast uh, app or on YouTube in the form of this narrated um, PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so we're going to focus on motivation today. Do I not sound motivated? Let me get a, get a swig of coffee here and uh, let's get started. Okay, so one of the first concepts we're going to talk about motivation. And motivation, first of all, is can be defined as a want or a need. I think in everyday life we know that those things are different. But they direct our behavior towards a certain goal. Okay, so that is what's called motivation. Now, if you remember us talking about behaviorism and B.F. Skinner and how our, all of our behaviors have a reinforcement, you notice that we avoided terms like motivation because that's more of an internal state, right? It's inside the black box of the brain, and behaviorists do not focus on that. So there is a lot of overlap in terms of how we look at our behavior, what's driving our behavior, but remember, the behaviors focus on external things, uh, reinforcements, rather than something that's built in. Well, more modern behaviors will acknowledge that. Of course, we have internal factors, and let's try to incorporate them. But let's talk about these two definitions here, these two terms about motivation that we can separate into intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation as what it sounds like. It's internal. And it's a feeling, it's a sense of, uh, oh, uh, I feel a sense of accomplishment, I feel a sense of personal confidence or satisfaction from doing something. So this will motivate me to do more of it, whatever that is, whether it's your job or a hobby or taking care of yourself, right? Now, an extrinsic motivation, these are external factors that motivate us, whether it could be uh, money, could be... Uh, a potential reward like a bonus at work or getting compliments from people could be uh, to avoid punishment right um, so intrinsics intrinsic factors tend to be very powerful right it gives us more of a sense of autonomy and independence and drives us to be really good at something and ext extrinsic motivation tends to be more limited because what if those external factors start to dry up, then our behavior would start to decrease. All right. Now what's interesting here is that we have to balance whether it's ourselves or as parents trying to motivate our children or teachers motivating young children at school to work hard, right, to have interest in something. Uh, it's very tricky, especially with younger children. Typically, if they're doing something and you don't feel the need to encourage them or reward them with something external or even praise them, but it's something they just enjoy doing, then just leave them alone because you know that they're motivated intrinsically, right? There's no need to add excessive or extra motivation. So sometimes parents, because maybe they learn psychology, wow, they're, they're doing something great like drawing right, or practicing music on their own, or dancing to a video, and so you want to encourage them, and so you praise them, you reward them somehow, maybe give them money, or whatever, okay, so you're giving them extrinsic motivation, what happens is, is that even though you think that's a reinforcement, it may be the wrong kind of reinforcement, it may conflict, or outweigh the intrinsic motivation, suddenly, they're not doing this for internal enjoyment. And this may not even be a conscious process for young people, right? They're just doing it for the sake of enjoyment. It's 
They're not really putting too much thought into what they're getting out of it other than enjoyment. And suddenly you're giving them, you know, a pizza coupon or whatever, free boba drink, okay, for finishing their homework or doing whatever it is that they were doing on their own. And suddenly they're working for that external reward, right? And so when the external reward goes away, the behavior goes away and the intrinsic motivation is gone, right? It's overshadowed. And this could happen to any professional that plays sports for fun. And then all of a sudden they're playing to be to get a scholarship. They're playing to, to earn their parents' uh, praise. They're, they're playing to impress the coach to, uh, or maybe they're, they're playing because they have a really huge contract. So would that interfere with the internal intrinsic enjoyment of engaging in that sport or does it become work? And then with work comes stress and a lot of negative emotions that might come with it, right? So how to reinforce, right? The best way, and here's some tips here from the textbook, using praise, using rewards that are intangible, right? Meaning that you you don't really see, so verbal praise can be good, right? Just very subtle. Nothing that will tip the scale to where they take their eye off of intrinsic motivation and suddenly they're focused on all that extrinsic reward. Uh, in college, I went to a university, University of Texas, where there's you know quite a few well-to-do students from wealthy families, and and they'll come to school in their car and they say, "Oh, I got this for high school graduation," or "I got this because of that." And I'm wondering, you know, at some point, did that take away their enjoyment of just enjoying being at school, being in class? You know, they're are they getting their grade because they're being promised a sports car, for example? Uh, note, I did not grow up that way. Okay, so when someone's expecting an extrinsic reward, then it can decrease the intrinsic reward. So I think you kind of get that. All right. Now, William James proposed uh, many, many decades ago that perhaps we're motivated by instinct, similar to animals, that we humans also have an instinct. And some of the examples that kind of makes sense is this motherly instinct, maternal instinct to protect and feed their young, right? A survival instinct, right? So these are the kind of things that we know that animals may have and they're trying to apply, and James is trying to apply that to human motivation, right? And the trouble is, is that we're, as human beings, we're more complex than many animals. Um, we can learn through observation or through other kinds of reinforcements, through social systems, and so just looking at instinct as a motivator uh, might be too simplistic uh, in many psychologists' view. Okay? Now, another way to look at motivation is the drive theory. Now, this is the uh, point of view that physically and psychologically, we're ideally trying to maintain homeostasis, a state of balance, right? Just think of your blood sugar, uh, your cholesterol, right? We want to be in a state of we're sort of in that middle zone, in that safe zone, right? And or like a car, right? All the fluids are topped up and it's running fine, and then suddenly something is lacking, and then that is the drive that pushes us to restore that balance. So if you're suffering from hunger, then what do we do? We eat to restore the balance of homeostasis. So we're satisfied, we're satiated, right? So this, is, this can be a physiological or psychological drive okay, to help us regain that sense of balance. Now, another point of view is the arousal theory of motivation. That is, one reason we're motivated to do things is to get stimulated in some way, right? And, you know, at the extreme level, you have those people who engage in extreme sports, right? Like parachuting or whatnot. And that everyday activity seems kind of boring, but they they really need to do something more extreme to get aroused, okay, to seek, to reduce boredom, right? So if we don't reach that optimal level of arousal, right, a sense of that physical or psychological stimulation, then we're under aroused, right? So we engage in behaviors to, uh, to sort of uh, increase our arousal right 
to in increase our motivation. Now, if we're overstimulated, then we try to do things to bring that down. So there is an optimal balance here, right? Sort of like driving a car. We drive too slow, we don't get anywhere, so we speed up. If we're going too fast, that's a little bit too much, we ease off the gas pedal. Now, Albert Bandura, you may remember him, the Stanford social psychologist who's famous for his Bobo doll study um, of social learning and observation, observational learning. He's also well known for the psychological principle called self-efficacy. This is different from self-esteem and it's also different from self-confidence, okay? So self-efficacy is your level of confidence i just said it's not confidence but it's your level of confidence how feel you, how good you feel about very specific tasks right so it's possible like so for example during my college years and, and amongst my geeky friends we had high self-efficacy when it came to math science classes we had very low self-efficacy when it came to uh romantic relationships or having dates and so forth right during my four years of college i only dated one person for about a week right that was pretty sad right by most people's standards and my friends were pretty much the same way and then if any of us were able to get on a date we would just sort of have a group meeting and talk about what did you do did you have some sort of secret language or handshake to get her to go out with you we just assumed that we would all be celibate the rest of our lives but uh, oddly enough, we're all more or less, uh, not everybody, but, you know, married with children and have, you know, that kind of life. But at the time, yeah, our, our self-efficacy about social relationships when it came to the opposite sex was pretty much rock bottom, right? So self-efficacy can vary depending on the task or if you're a student, depends on the academic uh, domain you're thinking about, right? So... Uh, let's talk about what Bandura talked about, that um, self, how self-efficacy plays a role in motivating our behavior, okay? And so what we believe about our expectations or the expected consequence of doing something, uh, let me give you an example of how self-efficacy works, and this is a demonstration I did with a bunch of I think uh, junior high school students, oftentimes back at the college I used to work for, uh, these middle school teachers would bring their classes for a tour of the community college where I worked. And many of us volunteered as instructors and staffed to do presentations or like a little tour guide. So I did a little activity about psychology and it was about self-efficacy, right? And so what I did was I prepared these uh, little pieces of paper and I handed them out but they didn't know that they each got a different set, right? And it was a word puzzle. So they had to uh, solve, rearrange the letters, and make the phrase out of it, right? For one half, they received a puzzle that was very easily solved, right? And the other half, they got one that was impossible to solve, right? So in essence, I'm setting up one group to have an experience of success, even though they may or may not inherently be good at puzzles or even like it, but they succeeded at it. And another group, whether or not they're good or bad at puzzles, they failed at solving the puzzle. So it created a sense of frustration and maybe dejection, right? Now you might think that, well, okay, they're, they're gonna work really hard. So they, I repeated this, and again, by row, actually, I, I don't quite remember exactly how I divvied it out, but I gave out other, um, puzzles okay and even and they got a little bit harder but the ones that had the initial experience of success more of that group solved the harder puzzle even though oh, I remember now everyone got the same puzzle for the second and third round okay so that initial stumbling and bad experience for that one group decrease their motivation and interest in trying to solve and their confidence at trying to solve that second puzzle. So no matter inherently whether they were good or bad at puzzles, that initial stumble 
really caused them to assume that they, they weren't going to be able to do it. So think about all those people out there talking to their friends about how they're bad at math or I'm not a math person, right? How much of that is due to social pressure, peer pressure, because just culturally math is not something we are proud of being good at, right, in terms of being a teenager. Um, you could be an outcast in school if you're openly about being good at math and science, right, unless you're within your own math science crowd and you reinforce each other, okay? So is it possible that an initial bad experience in your very first math class and having bad grades created this low self-efficacy and someone reinforces that mindset that I'm just not a math person, I'll focus on these other areas. So is it possible that if you think about what your hobbies and your professional uh, skills are today, whatever age you are, can it be traced back to a fork in the road during middle school or primary school where you just convince yourself because of an early experience of success or an early experience of failure that I am this kind of person, I am not that kind of person? I'm a, I'm a language person. I'm an art person. I'm not a math person, right? And so, I mean, is there anything inherently built into one's brain that makes one a math person and makes one an artistic person? Not necessarily, right? We, we can be sure that's probably not the case. Our environment often shapes our access and uh, uh, our choices. But I think self-efficacy is very powerful. Think about sports, right? If a young person's out there shooting basketball uh, hoops in their backyard and they just never get one in okay then it's likely that person might give up and just say well basketball's not for me maybe I'm too short maybe I just don't have the skills and they don't try that's the main thing right but what if one time out of ten they would hit a shot that goes in right remember intermittent uh, reinforcement okay partial reinforcement that, that fits in here, right? All you need is that. It's just like gambling. You just need to know that one out of 100 pulls of this slot machine in Vegas will win you some money and you'll keep trying, right? So self-efficacy has a lot to do with that. So is it possible that your favorite sport is your favorite sport to play because you had an early experience of success as opposed to an early experience of, let's say, failure okay, or disappointment, okay? And that creates an identity Right? A momentum, in a sense, that, oh, I'm a rock climber. I'm going to keep climbing. Uh, our daughter's great at rock climbing. Who knew, right? She just tried it one day. And that initial sense of mastery and self-efficacy just kicked in, right? But I can see that when other kids were there trying it for the first time, you know, they didn't really have a good experience, and boom, low self-efficacy for that specific task. Okay. So let's move on. All right, this is one of the more memorable theories in psychology. And oftentimes you'll see Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs placed in a personality chapter, which we'll cover soon. Uh, but in this case, more modern textbooks are in the introduction of psychology are placing it in the motivation chapter. So Maslow, as a humanistic psychologist, his theory of motivation is that we are motivated to satisfy certain needs, right? From basic needs to more higher level psychological needs. And this, and usually it's a, in a graphic form in a textbook as a form of a pyramid. So imagine that throughout our lives, we are trying to climb this pyramid and this is what motivates us to be better, to, uh, to be better for the world, to improve ourselves and to have social relationships. So from the most bottom level, of course, we need physiological needs to be met. Food, water, shelter, okay? Um, before we can really free ourselves to seek other kinds of needs, such as status or whether I'm good at a certain skill, right? You have to have food and shelter first. That's primary. Um, when you watch uh, that old show Survivor, right, where they put a bunch of random people, well, somewhat random people on an island and they're trying to survive, right? So the first thing they have to do is figure out how to get food and, and create a shelter, right? That's their primary. And then they strategize about who they're going to partner with, right, along the way. But that's more of a secondary thing. 
if they were truly stranded, they would be 100% focused on food, water, and shelter. Then we have our security needs, so we're continuing to climb this pyramid. And this has to do with our personal safety, uh, financial security, right? So having a job, having a uh, not just a roof overhead, but a sense of security in some sense, right? Then we move up the ladder more, we have social needs, right? And of course, that has to do with friendships, family, uh, romantic relationships, right? So a lot of us might sort of be stuck here early on in our lives, especially like, say, high school, early college is all about trying to find which group you belong to, feel a sense of belonging, right? So an overwhelming amount of energy is, is placed uh, there. And it just seems like you're kind of stuck and you can't really go anywhere. You don't have a sense of again confidence to just do your own thing on your own because you're still searching for a group to belong to and then we move up and we have esteem needs so we have physiological then security then social and now we're having a self-esteem category near the top of the pyramid and this is where we do stuff such as um, doing things for all self-worth uh, do things like enter a golf tournament to win a trophy um, build things for our own self-confidence right engage in hobbies improve our work skills okay and a lot of people according to maslow the majority of people 90 plus percent we were okay with that right we have our safety and security we have our job we're in a good marriage we have kids two and a half kids one and a half dogs right a two and a half car garage okay <laughs> and uh, i would like to see a household like that by the way that'd be kind of weird and that and then we're happy you know we have our uh, netflix we have our uh you know football team season tickets yeah you're doing really well if you get that and that's life right you just sort of go through your routine and that's that's what life is you take your kids to soccer practice and you don't really spend a lot of time doing much else but a very small percentage of people according to maslow and his theory actually reach a stage called self-actualization and also some textbooks will include another level called self-transcendence okay but self-actualization basically means reaching your full potential but not necessarily in a selfish way but reaching your full potential in the sense that you're doing the best to in terms of your education and skills and athletic ability whatever that might be to reach that potential but also using it for the greater good, okay? Um, and therefore finding a sense of inner fulfillment that you're playing a part that's bigger than yourself, okay? So you can argue that the esteem level, you know, yeah, you're paying your taxes and maybe you're involved in the community and these kinds of things, but then that self-actualization level, like, you know, the, the Mother Teresa's and Martin Luther King's of the world, right, sacrificing their own needs to for the betterment of society, just sticking their neck out, that's considered self-actualization. All right, so this next section, uh, to finish up this particular section of the book about motivation, is more physiological, but it's also psychological, and that has to do with hunger and eating. So we're gonna talk about eating disorders, obesity, and, and concepts related to that in terms of food and eating. And I think a lot of people are surprised to find this in a psychology textbook. It's like, oh, really? There's a whole section about obesity and, and trying to reach a sense of balance. So uh, there's a little bit of biology involved in terms of the physiology of hunger, um, that we're trying to reach a sense of balance and uh, some hormones are released when we eat to signal that we're full, right? So if we're missing anything whether it's glucose or having an empty stomach, right? A series of events happens that initiates a sense of motivation to try, to try to satisfy those particular needs, okay? So, whether, so it starts with a hunger signal, then we ingest food, and then we have a sense of sati satiety, okay? I don't know how to pronounce that. A sense of satiation, right? Now, metabolism when we talk about our weight, and I think this g can play a big part in how we make judgments of people. Uh, we're very weight conscious as a society, and, and this is nearly universal around the world in terms of how we see our bodies. And of course, it varies by culture. But 
especially in Western industrialized countries, we're very weight conscious, right? Thinner is better and so forth. And we make negative judgments on those who have larger body weights, right? Um, now, America and the United States this is a big problem. We have an industrialized country with a lot of conveniences, or in some neighborhoods, they're called food deserts. So they may not have the ability to obtain healthy options in their neighborhood. Uh, so to go to a grocery store that has better options or restaurants, they have to go further out, which is not convenient. So in their neighborhoods, they're stuck with McDonald's and all that, all the kinds of fast foods, which are not good for you in the long run, right? Sorry, McDonald's, don't sue me, okay? It's, all right, so one's weight has to do with genetics and environment. So this is the nature and nurture, right? Remember last time I talked about nature versus nurtures, but this is really an interaction of both of them. And if you don't believe that genetics plays a part, all you have to do is do a little bit of casual people watching at a park. And if you see families, you know, hanging out together, sometimes you can readily see, it's like, oh, you know, that family there has a particular... You know, they've inherited a particular body shape, right? Um, there's a really tall family over there, a relatively short family over there, and so forth. So genetics definitely plays a part in uh, what our experience is, okay? Yay, an interruption. I was in... All right, somebody pick up the phone. Yeah. All right, let me turn that off. The thing about recording uh, my podcasts is that I don't have a pause button. So whatever happens, happens. Okay, so uh, let's talk about set point theory, right? This is the idea that every person has their own ideal body weight or what's called a set point, which tends to resist change, right? That's why some people who they're striving for a perfect number in their mind, like a weight, right, or a waist size, they're really fighting against where their body wants to be, okay? And so according to this theory, that set point is genetically determined, right? And so efforts to move weight significantly from this set point is met with a lot of resistance by the body and takes a lot of effort to get there. Right, and so I think a lot of people who try a lot of different diets and bounce back to a certain weight may experience this. That uh, that maybe there there is something related to genetics that's holding me back from reaching that particular goal. Now, the downside of the set point theory is that it doesn't really take into account because it's focused so much on genetics that there are social environmental factors like I talked about before that can have a great influence on our body weight, right? And that has to do with our lifestyle, has to do with, um, you know, portion sizes of restaurants. Uh, think about the size of the cups used at restaurants, whatever kind of restaurants you think about. And if you travel the world and then come back to the U.S., you know how kind of crazy our food portions are and our beverage portions are that... Uh, you can, at a movie theater, easily get a drink that can serve a family of four at a meal, but yet this is one person, and then you can refill that, right? So think about all these this extra sugar and calories that we're unnecessarily ingesting, and if we do that on a regular basis, that could really cause a harm in health. Um, a lot of our coffee drinks are not healthy because of the high sugar content in some of these flavored type coffee drinks. I only drink black coffee, which if you do the research actually has zero calories, right? So it's water, hot water filtered through grounded coffee, coffee beans, right? And so um, once you add milk, creamer, especially that artificial dairy stuff, and then you have sugar, um, then you're adding unnecessarily unnecessary sugars and calories to a drink that was healthy. Same thing with tea. And the bubble teas, right? Extremely high in sugar. So it's no wonder that some of my friends who are not even overweight are borderline diabetic um, because of these habits of uh, just in our everyday environment, right? So that can have a big contribution to our weight and our health. Um, 
some obesity statistics here that are quite alarming and they're related to the BMI, the body mass index, and you can easily find a calculation of that online and it has to do with the proportion between your height and weight. Now, of course, you know, just because someone is 200 pounds and six foot two, you know, they could really vary in their body shapes, obviously. Someone could be an elite athlete and someone else could be a couch potato. And, you know, and so obviously their health status is not gonna be the same. So the BMI on its own can never be an indicator for health, okay? Um, so you definitely have to look at family history, look at behaviors and their diet and intake, right? So it's not just that alone. But there are a lot of factors that contribute to obesity in our society, right? So the statistics are that two out of three adults struggle with being overweight, okay? And according to the BMI index, uh, anything over 25 is really overweight, a BMI, right? So, and, and again, this, you have to put this in perspective because when you go to a foreign country um, that does not have issues with overweightness, and those countries are becoming fewer and fewer, but when you go to societies where people walk around more, um, their diet portions are smaller, right? Let's say like Thailand, okay? Uh, and the ingredients in the food are not quite as, uh, and of course, I'm just generalizing here, of course you could eat really fatty Thai food every day, and, and, but a typical meal has very small portion sizes compared to an American meal, right? Again, just generalizing here based on our experience of living there for four, four years. So, and, uh, and you, you're not gonna get, you know, soda fountain drinks that are unlimited, okay? Even in Europe, you get charged for extra tea or refills and so forth, and you're not gonna have a huge cup of it, right? And you walk around more, you're in places where they use mass transit, okay? Or even a motorbike culture, right? Being out, sweating, um, having to push your motorbike around to park and so forth, right? You exert energy, then uh, a typical day in America could be just walking out of your house into the garage, get in your air-conditioned car, go to work, walk a few steps to work, and sit all day until you leave work, right? So it's possible to not really not have that much physical movement. All right, so a lot of things, uh, health risks are associated with obesity, so many of them are listed here. And some are really obvious these days that we know of. Colon cancer, arthritis, type two diabetes, other kinds of cancers, stroke, cardiovascular disease, right? Um, and so typical weight reduction has a lot to do, you know, it has to be diet and exercise, right? A lifestyle change, but changing what one eats, the portion size, physical movement, right? So there's really a lot of common sense there. In the more extreme case, some people undergo bariatric surgery where a band is placed over their stomach, right? Uh, surgically that actually re makes a person feel fuller sooner. Now, related to food and diet and all that is eating disorders. Now, these are actual psychological disorders that are listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual from the American Psychiatric Association. That's the DSM, right? The Manual of Disorders. And there are two major categories. Okay, let me explain this a little bit. One, and some of you may have known about this, and one's called bulimia nervosa, bulimia. And this is where um, someone binges and purges, right? So it's compulsive eating followed by purging, basically vomiting, okay? And so you have to wonder, a lot of these eating disorders are about controlling weight. It's about having um, a distorted view of their own body, right? And so oftentimes there are psychological trauma issues that underlie this, whether it's depression, anxiety. Uh, folks who have eating disorders have higher risk for substance abuse, right? And because of the vomiting, uh, it can damage their teeth because of the acids, right? Uh, and it's just not really good for the body, obviously. And some people use laxatives. Um, so it's a combination of the binge eating Right, and then the guilt that follows the binge eating because that's a form of self-medication, then they vomit it out because they're afraid of gaining that weight, 
So it's a bit of a binging and purging. Whereas anorexia is basically starving oneself, right? With withholding calories from their bodies. And that is where they have a condition where they see in the mirror a distorted body image that even though an onlooker might see someone who's severely underweight and can see their rib cage, um, but they look in the mirror and they see themselves as being overweight or fat, right? And so obviously there are many health consequences and some people actually die from that malnutrition. Uh, for women, um, they may lose their menstrual cycle, right? It may be affected. And also anxiety, mood, and substance abuse disorders are associated with anorexia nervosa. So if you think about what could cause an eating disorder, um, the people who are most at risk is the folks who live in Western societies, mainly female in the adolescent age of 15 to early adulthood of 19, right? Uh, so usually Caucasian females in that range. And a lot of that has to do with media exposure since uh, this kind of research has been around even pre-social media. And the fear was that uh, teens, especially girls, and this can affect boys, obviously, and men, men but primarily it's, it's a female-type issue where there's a lot of social pressure on their physical appearance. And then there's the onslaught of teen magazines, right? This is pre-social media. So imagine all that social pressure now is on their cell phone where you see perfect Instagrammers and YouTubers and, and people who look perfect, you know, and then suddenly, you know, thinking about the developmental process of being a teen and how impressionable they are and that their pre prefrontal cortex cortices are still developing, right, and affecting their judgment and impulsivity, They're, it's a ripe environment. And sometimes athletes fall into this eating disorder where they have to be under a certain weight to enter a competition. You see more eating disorders among swimmers and gymnasts, for example, right? So cultural messages from media is definitely a big factor. And this is borne out by a variety of studies. There was an interesting study many, many years ago uh, on an isolated, I believe, uh, so South Pacific or Polynesian island where they actually did not have Western media, right? They pretty much lived off the land and their ideal body image for females was basically round and big hips, okay? Sort of larger than what we would think of in the, in the United States. And then they suddenly gained electrical power, they gained access to Western style media and then over the years, amongst their teen girls, they saw higher rates and increased rates of eating disorders that, and conscientiousness of weight that did not exist before. So in the past, traditionally, people were just sort of happy. They had full bodies. And then suddenly, uh, there's dieting behavior and, and eating disorders came about. So there's a very clear effect of that media image um, and social pressure. Okay. Uh, to be uh, perfect and and to avoid to you know to want to have that perfect image whether it's their face or or their weight. Okay, maybe it should motivate you that we're done for this particular chapter. So we've covered quite a few a variety of theories related to the to the field of motivation. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of a baseline to understanding the kinds of factors that motivate us. And if you have any questions, try to reach me at, again at Jack B. Teaching. My students know how to find me. For those who are not my students, find me on Twitter at Jack B. Teaching. Okay, folks, till next time.